internationally is, is really, um, you know, something that they, they are. I mean, yeah. it's just a matter of the timing and everything like that. So, but there's speculation that if it does happen, it won't probably happen to soft white right out of the gate because it's um, primarily exported to the Asian market, which has said we're not really ready to do GMOs and that we don't want GMOs. Mm -hmm. So if anything, it would probably be in the hard reds that are more geared towards um, reds. But it's anybody's guess. They've been saying seven to ten years for the last ten to fifteen years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I first went to work in the wheat industry, dates me in 1990, uh, they were tell at that time I was here in 12 years. It was 1990, and I'm still here in 10 to 12 years. So who knows when it's going to happen? But it probably will, just to uh, not feed the world. Okay, nutritional impact. They're saying gluten, and a lot a lot of the surveys show that people said that gluten-free foods were healthier than their gluten-containing <coughs> counterparts. They're often higher in fat, sugar, and calories, and the reason they are is because they need the fat uh, and the sugar for volume and taste. And you add those in, you're going to add more calories. So that's very common that they are higher in those. They're usually lower in the B vitamins, uh, iron, folic acid. Folic well, acid is a B vitamin. But that's because they're not enriched. Now, they could be enriched, but they're not. Most of them are not enriched with these B vitamins. Uh, many people actually gain weight on this diet. In fact, one case was uh, BMI 56% higher after she went on a gluten-free diet. So uh, that kind of shifts that. But uh, they use very few whole grains in these. I don't know if you've ever looked at the labels on very few whole grains. They could use them, but they, they're usually all refined and not enriched. And they're often lower in protein, much lower in fiber, because they use a lot of like soy, potato starch, tapioca, instead of like a whole grain, which they should, if they're gonna make a gluten-free product, they should be using like a quinoa or a sorghum or a rice that's whole grain, something like that, uh, but they're not. So that's part of the problem. There is absolutely not one single study that shows you lose weight on a gluten-free diet. Now, people do lose weight going gluten-free, and that's because they cut out, you know, all the cookies and cakes and, you know, sitting in the bar eating pretzel. I mean, they cut out all these foods. You cut out calories, you're going to lose weight. You cut out any food food, you're going to lose weight. They probably just quit drinking beer. You what? They probably just quit drinking beer. <laughs> they might have quit yeah, drinking beer. Right? Good point. They would cut <laughs> out a lot of calories and lose weight. <laughs> yeah. So just the fact that, because gluten is a protein, it's no more... It contains four grams uh, or four calories per gram of protein. You know, protein just like there's four calories per gram of carbohydrate. So it's not that that's not why we're losing weight. Okay, does it affect bones? Have any of you heard this rumor? No. no. Well, I heard it. I heard it once from um, a TV station from Korea. Came okay, clear out to Colorado to interview me in July. And this is one of the things going around in Korea about. And then, since then, I've heard it in the U.S. And um, that's the first time I've heard of it, just recently. There really is no relationship between gluten or wheat and bone marrow. So if somebody tells you that, there's not. Now, some studies have shown that a high-protein diet, a really high-protein diet, can affect calcium absorption and then lower bone mass. But, this high protein diet is really, really high in animal protein. It's like a paleo diet. It's not like a common sense, you know, I mean, every, everything in moderation. My husband, if you look in the dictionary under carnivore, there's a picture of my husband. <laughs> and I've often said, if I had an affair, if I embezzled money, if I murdered somebody, he would stick by me to the end. But if I made him go vegetarian, he'd be out the door. <laughs> and so we firmly believe that, you know, all foods in moderation, you need that meat protein. I mean, you can live on a vegetarian diet, very healthy, absolutely. But I wouldn't want to. Uh, but this is what they're showing, that very, very high protein diets may cause some effect. But then, High in anything causes bad problems. Now, the one thing that wheat belly diet points out 
is that the digestion of grains produces acidic byproducts. Well, meats and dairy also produce acidic byproducts. But if you're eating all foods in moderation, you're getting fruits and vegetables, and they produce alkaline byproducts, so it balances out and we're perfectly healthy. So that's the problem with like these consumer advice books. They take little snippets and then they forget to tell you the whole story. And so it's really hard for the consumer to understand what's important. But all foods in moderation. And I always say, if everybody ate all foods in moderation, I'd be out of the job. <laughs> so I guess that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gluten and fungus, gluten's a protein. Candida is a fungus, their structures are not similar, and the body's receptor, receptors aren't going to react the same way. So if anybody tells you that, I don't know, have you heard that one? No. Okay. Gluten, collagen, keratin, you know what collagen and keratin is. It's our hair, or for the nails, or bones, the whole whatever. It's, um, hair loss does happen sometimes with people that have celiac disease or any other autoimmune disease. It's a characteristic of an autoimmune disease if they do it. It's not anything to do with gluten. Um, but, oh, let me go back. Uh, I always say that if this was really true, all of us who have eaten gluten and wheat as long as, through, what, 10,000 years, we'd all be this little jellyfish mass, <laughs> all whatever, no bones, no structure. So, really, there's, there's no truth. Uh, fermentable carbohydrates are good. We often hear about carbohydrates being bad. Um, they do actually, the fermentable carbohydrates, which wheat is one, all grains are, they actually decrease our blood sugar levels, which is good. They reduce our triglycerides. You know, when you go and have a, um, uh, your annual exam, they check your triglycerides to see if they're too high. They actually reduce body weight and they improve immune status improve mineral and uh, vitamin and mineral absorption, so they're important to have in your body. Um, I just don't know, but what's an example of a non-fermented part? Okay, you know those food maps, FODMAPs, I'm sorry, yeah, FODMAPs yeah. I showed you? Any of the carbohydrates that aren't on that list oh, are okay. not fermentable. Okay. Yeah, but most of them, most carbohydrates are fermentable, and they produce gas. And all these people that are so worried about gas coming from, I have a friend that she swears gluten gives her gas, and I always say, gas is a good thing. <laughs> uh, if you don't have gas, you're not eating enough and not, it's fiber and fermentable carbohydrates. Now, she may have access where it's painful and stuff, uh, so that's something that may be wrong there. Gas is a good thing. Okay, wheat consumption is not associated with belly fat or obesity, and I'll just, um, this, this one is not a scientific reason, but when you look at the French, they eat one and a half times as much wheat as we do, they have a third of our obesity rate. The Italians eat twice as much wheat as we do, they have one fourth of our obesity rate. So you can't blame wheat consumption on obesity. There's so many things involved in obesity, and like I said, one of them may be our gut health, but one of them may be these people don't drive ours as they much as we do. They want everything. They don't have, uh, in in their gas stations, they don't always have these wonderful food marts. And stuff. <laughs> There's a book, um, um, Why French Women Don't Get Fat. Oh, yeah. And it's really, I, mean, I read it years ago, and it's, it talks about, I mean, they drink more wine, they eat more breads, they eat cheese. more pasta, they eat more cheese. Yeah. And yet, they're, I didn't yes. know, the one third, one third of our abuse rate, it went into all the, I guess, psychology of raising not fat children. Yeah. And it was it's called why French women don't get fat. And a lot of it is eating less and exercising more. Yeah. Yep. Now, a lot of people will try and tell you carbohydrates make fat. I have friends that they really <coughs> watch their carbohydrates or they cut down on carbohydrates because it's gonna make them fat. When you look at all these studies that have these are annual ongoing studies throughout the US and Canada. The N. Haynes study, this is what the CDC in the U.S. does. It's an ongoing study. You've probably had CDC researchers in this area. They come in, they measure your height, your weight, they do food questionnaires, they check your blood, they check, you know, doing the 
caliper tests for fat. This goes on all the time in the United States. In fact, our vice president, who I mentioned earlier is a RD, she worked for this study for 18 years. And she's seen the whole United States because of this study. But that study, CSFFI, uh, FII, used to be a separate study, and it's now uh, rolled into NHANES. Um, this is the women's health study, the nurses' health study. I mean, all of these studies, Canadian health study, the ongoing study, the more carbohydrates you eat, you eat up to 60% 60, 60 carbohydrates, you have a lower BMI than if you're only eating up to, you know, like 25, 35, 45% of carbohydrates. If you're eating 25, you're gonna have a higher BMI. So, when people tell you carbohydrates make you fat, no, carbohydrates don't make you fat. Too many carbohydrates will make you fat, too much protein will make you fat, too much fat will make you fat, but it's all uh, in moderation. So don't let anybody tell you that. Um, yes? Well, I think also people like are under the, like when you said carbohydrates, everyone thinks bread and pastries and whatever, Case but they don't is. think like fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Or carbohydrates too. Yeah, that, so. I, that is so true. People say, well, I'm cutting back on my carbohydrates. I'm eating more fruits and vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people, you're right. People don't know that. So that is a problem there. The, the uh, thing about wheat consumption, that's what's making us fat. When you look at wheat consumption trends, this started in you know, the early 1800s up to a little over 2000. We should have been at our highest obesity rate around the uh, 1880s, because that's when we ate the most wheat. And we know we we're not at our highest obesity rate then, because people were working harder, they had less cars, they had, you know, all those kind of things. So during that time, we had dropped considerably. And this is recent consumption trends. Around 2000, we were higher uh, at about 147 pounds. And then it really went down and came back up a little bit about 2007, dropped to its lowest in years, 2012. So I think that's really interesting that, uh, and now that in the last two years, we actually finally have gone up in wheat consumption a little bit. But let's face it, this is just recent, and the obesity has been going up since the or 1980s. That's when we first started the seeing the obesity trends. So it doesn't really have anything to do with how much wheat we're eating. Wheat is addictive. William Davis bases his wheat is addictive that has gotten all over the internet and on Dr. Oz's show and wherever else on this one study that was done in 1979. It's done a National Health Institute of Health study. And it was done in vitro with some peptides. It was not done in the human body using wheat products. It was done with peptides in a test tube. And these test tubes, these peptides, are our pro wheat proteins that they use, um, and interacted with these receptors in the brain. And he said that's like, you know, cocaine does. It interacts with receptors in the brain, therefore it's addictive. Well, this wasn't done on intact wheat. It wasn't eaten, it wasn't consumed. It was done on a test tube. And nobody's followed up on the study, even though in the NIH study says, you know, if you want to find out if this is true with real wheat, then do some studies. Nobody's done it. And so they've really never looked at the issue. The other thing that uh, Wheat Belly doesn't discuss, oh, these peptides aren't unique to wheat. They're found in uh, all other kinds of proteins, milk, rice, and even spinach. And I, and I always say that the possibility of people becoming addicted to spinach is a dietitian's dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen. <laughs> but it's the same peptides that are in wheat. So I want to take that to heart. Um, we are making progress. Um, we've had some really good positive newspaper and television. You saw one of the television things lately. So it's rolling back a little bit. Most of the anti-heat and gluten information, this wouldn't have happened 50 years ago. It's on the internet. Yeah. There's only about 
on, what's on the internet, only about 0.5% of what's on the internet is from a researcher or from a, you know, scientist. The rest of it is just pretty much garbage. Uh, this was one done in the New York Times this summer. These are ones that have been uh, out since July. Um, that was a good, that was a good article. Uh, another one in the New York Times. They did another one on the sub subjects. Jimmy Kimmel, uh, National Post did an article. Uh, Washington Post did an article. This was in uh, late July. Uh, there's a YouTube video. <laughs> what the heck is gluten? I think that's the one you sent me, wasn't it, Mary? So. That, yeah. that was a great art that really talked oh, about the science of um, yeah. uh, gluten. Um, gluten equals bad. Uh, this one done in Chicago on one of their radio stations was really good. And then finally, you know who Charlize Theron is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gorgeous, beautiful uh, woman, actress. Because you know, it's the Miley Cyrus's of the world and the women Paltrow's of the world that really got this all started. Well, finally, we have an actress sticking out for us. But I'm just warning you before you go on to look at Chelsea lately. This is kind of R-rated, so if you want to look at that, it's funny. I loved it, but not everybody probably has would appreciate it. So I'm just warning you. <laughs> I even said x ray to do this. But it's a wonderful article. One of her best friends sent her gluten free muffins for her birthday. And Charlize goes, Why would you send me this blank for my birthday? I'm celebrating it. I don't want to be sick. I, want to. I just thought that was really, it was really good. So, anyway, um, oh, wheat causes this deep. I, somehow I got this slide out of order. Wheat causes this deep. 400 calories more a day, if you heard that. It's really 440 more calories a day. Um, and that's in the Wheat Belly book. And uh, they, if you really did the math, 440 more calories a day times 365 is 160,000 plus calories. And if you divided that by 3,500, which it takes to make us gain and lose a kind of fat, that means we gain about 46 pounds a year. Now, I don't think. Even though we have an obesity epidemic, people aren't gaining 46 pounds a year, so that's kind of whatever. So, do you have any um, any questions? Um, I, I have a question. Um, I saw in the store um, Cheerios uh -huh. that now have extra protein. I know. That's is, the big kick. Is that gluten? When are they just filling it? Of is course it, it is. That's what I thought, but yeah. we, were, we were talking about that. Yeah. Probably. So just, well, I said, of course it is. It's probably in the book. So if they wrote extra gluten on it, no one would buy it. <laughs> and how would we know that? If we're reading the label, how would we know that it's due to extra I gluten? It. That's it what I would like to know. Yeah. Anyway. I don't, in fact, when you said that, I immediately thought it was extra gluten. It may not be. It may be some other protein, but I don't know what it would be in Cheerios. So I we would need to know our proteins in order to be able to identify that on the list of ingredients yeah, then? Probably. Correct? Yeah. But that is interesting because protein is such, it's the big thing now. Everybody's going on protein. Most Americans, except, you know, the ones on really low income and homeless, get enough protein in their diets. Um, it's very few people that don't get enough protein, but that's kind of the big hit, and that's why Cheerios is doing that. Cheerios also really ticked me off last year that they made this big deal about going, um, GMO free, so and yet the scientists at, at General Mills that we work with, we've got some on our board, you know, they don't think anything's wrong with GMO, but the company, and then the company did come up and say, we're not going to do that again, we didn't get any increase in sales. <laughs> Mary? I just looked up the um, Cheerios protein and ingredient list, and oh. it's um, whole grain corn, which is Cluster, yeah. in parentheses, is whole grain oats, sugar, soy protein isolate, oh, oh. almonds, soy flour, corn syrup, canola oil, wheat flour, bran wheat flour, tapioca starch, molasses, salt, soy oh. lecithin, honey, baking soda, natural flavor, vitamin E, and oil of rosemary added to preserve <laughs> freshness. And then sugar, whole grain oats. So whole grain oats is theoretically. Third down the ingredient list. Exactly. 
Wait, so yeah, so soy protein is right? probably what it is. Well, but you is. said also flour, wheat flour, and gram wheat flour. Bread tapioca starch. Yeah, because Cheerios used to be 100% oats. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I so if, you more, more, if you want more synthetic ingredients. Exactly. Because <laughs> but that, you know, that I think could be deceiving for people that have celiac disease. They thought all their life they've been safe eating yes. Cheerios. Yeah, but it does say it should contain soy, almond, and wheat ingredients, which are probably the top three. There are some of the uh, uh, allergens. Corn, yeah. as far as allergies. Yeah, because corn's not an allergen. So if they're GMO free, then how can they put corn syrup in it? No, it's got corn. It's got whole corn. corn. Yeah, it has corn. Well, well you have, have to get non. It's got corn too. Oh, you can get it. And soy. So it doesn't say it's not GMO free. But I thought General Mills was GMO. No, no. They went away from that. Oh, right. Cereals. Oh, but this Cheerios oh, should not be protein. They're not saying it's GMO. Oh, they can't. So that's corn. the other thing. <laughs> do you want to do you want to eat or do you want GMO? Yeah. Yeah. No. Because there's a really good chance that this, because soy and corn, anything derivative, your Coke that you drink, is GMO. Yeah. 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 But because yeah. we don't have, a, we don't have a requirement saying it's not GMO, they're not going to tell you it's GMO. Yeah, because they don't have a label. And Judy, I did give them the truth about gluten in their binders. They all oh, have so they have that. Oh, okay. All right. These are the handouts that I brought. Um, it's too I brought them up there. Um, thank you. So the truth about gluten, I know it's really small and it's hard to read. From so the third is section, I think. Oh, this is, um, no, it's actually the fourth section. Fourth section right behind your wheat back. And I did bring some more, some more of these if you want some. But this mm -hmm. was made to go in a newspaper for family features. So just give this to newspapers. Nice. Wow. So picture this little tiny tie. Picture it newspaper size. And then you understand why it ends up being this small one mm -hmm. and a little one, because it was developed for a newspaper. Um, so, it, and uh, we've got, kind of, and it's interesting, you know, newspapers are really losing, we're losing newspapers all the time in this country because mm -hmm. everybody's going online and news cast and news mm -hmm. webs and websites. And we've really found that out with this distribution. We've gotten about uh, two some million readers, newspapers. We've gotten like 23 million online and about uh, the same on webcasts. So that really tells you where I am. Uh, that's there and that's why it's too small. And then I did bring a poster for each of you for, if you want to use it in the schools. It's kind of cute. It's got lifestyles of the fit and famous when we're talking about clean all of these products are made about fit and fabulous. So if you want to use, if you find any use for those, you can still have them. And then the other one is the great game, brain paper, where kids go through and try and find different meat products in there. So if you want to take these and use them, fine. If not, you don't have to. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, just had a couple of comments. Uh, my wife's going gluten-free for food allergies, and she seems to notice some improvements in some of the symptoms that she's had. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, a couple of things we learned is you can have products that don't have wheat or gluten in them, but they won't label them gluten-free because they don't want to have to go through the certification right. process. Mm -hmm. So you might read the ingredients and not see wheat. Mm -hmm. It would be safe unless you have cereal or something like that. Right. Yeah. But then the other thing is uh, mm -hmm. they make beer now that has the gluten removed. Yeah, yeah. Who does yeah. Has yeah but really good there's only about one or two that are actually gluten free. A lot of them are advertised as gluten free, and the reason I know this is because Tricia Thompson, does, she has a business called the Gluten Free Watchdog. And she has actually gotten samples of those and haven't analyzed. And there's only about one or two of these beers that really <coughs> the, would qualify. The, the beer? Yeah. Yeah. So oh yeah. So go back to what you said. What, was there no regulation, or they don't have to abide by a certain? Well, right now, if they want to label it gluten free, it has to have less than 20 parts per million. But in the regulations, they do not have to have. They do not have to test ahead of time. The only time they have to test is when FDA comes to them and says, "We don't think this is gluten free, and we want to see proof." Right or if FDA does the testing. The problem, though, is FDA is so underfunded, 
and that they cannot, they just don't have time to go out and do all this because they have it for all the products, gluten-free and otherwise. So I think a lot of manufacturers are kind of, you know, maybe they just know that they can get away with it and they can sell a lot of beer before FDA ever shuts them down or a lot of products. So I'd, I'd make, you know, it's kind of important. For, and celiacs, a lot of them know not to drink beer, period. But some of them might want to try that, the gluten-free stuff, and if they react, they'll know well, yeah, in most cases. Two or three beers that are brewed without uh, wheat. barley or wheat. Wheat, barley or wheat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, long, I don't know, what, what do they use if they don't use wheat, barley, or rye for beer? Mary, do you know? Uh, I think it was sorghum. Oh, could be. Yeah, sorghum beer, yeah. Yeah, sorghum is. Probably not very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorghum. Go through this, you know, ask me questions if you don't understand, ask me is there some way that I can interpret this information for my kids, um, please, thank you, we're making it very informal. Uh, just to start off with, I have been interested in wheat and gluten ever since I was a little girl because my older brother was diagnosed with celiac disease over 60 years ago. Now at that time, 45% of people who had celiac disease died. They didn't know it was called celiac disease. Uh, he was one of the banana babies. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. That's all they knew that kids could eat and survive on. Um, they didn't know what was causing the celiac, but they knew they could live on bananas. So I don't think he eats bananas to this day. <laughs> uh, but And also the food that he had to eat in those days, even as they got older, even when he was tan, they knew he could eat other things and they knew he couldn't eat gluten. But the food in those days was so disgusting that, uh, you know, mom had to cook for him special. The other thing we didn't know in those days is that you cannot have someone celiac in your house and serve other people uh, anything that has wheat, barley, or rye in it because it contaminates uh, the, the products that they're eating. And we didn't know that. So mom baked bread my whole life. And it must have been really chewing up my brother's intestines, but we didn't know it at the time. So we're really, I'm thrilled to death to see um, all these wonderful gluten-free products. What I'm not thrilled about is the way it's being treated as a fad diet. I mean, if you didn't have kidney disease, you would not go on a kidney disease diet. Why are people going on a CVAC disease diet? Uh, you know, I don't understand, but um, that's one of the things that we're having a problem with nowadays. But I'd like to start off with this video. I don't know how many of you have already seen that. It's Jimmy Kimmel. People are very interested in food nowadays. People who don't even cook watch cooking shows. And everyone has an opinion on what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Lately, I don't know if it's just here in LA, but people are very anti-gluten, which bothers me because I'm very pro-pizza, and you can't be <laughs> pro-pizza and anti-gluten. So um, now some people can't eat gluten for medical reasons, which that I get. I, it annoys me, but I get it. But a lot of people here don't eat gluten because like uh, someone in their yoga class told them not to. I keep asking people about this, and I started to wonder how many of these people even know what gluten is. So we decided to find out. Gluten, in case you didn't know, and I didn't know this, is a mixture of two proteins found in wheat and some other natural grains. But here in LA, it's comparable to Satanism. It's, it's <laughs> so we sent a camera crew out to a popular exercise spot, right up the street from us, to ask people who are gluten-free a simple question. What is gluten? What is this thing you will not eat? So we're going to meet a person that doesn't eat gluten, and together we're going to guess if they know what gluten is. Are you ready? Yeah. Now, what else do you have? Do you maintain a gluten-free diet? I do indeed. And what is gluten? Okay. Does he know <laughs> what gluten is? No. Everyone says no. Well, as far as for me, how it affects my body. Uh, but what, but what is gluten? Oh, and that, this is pretty sad because I don't know. <laughs> well, for one. But I hate it. I don't know. Next. Do you maintain a gluten free diet? I do. What is gluten? Alright, does, does this shirtless gentleman know it? Yes, okay. Uh, gluten's in bread, it's a uh, flour derivative wheat, things like that. <laughs> it's a flour derivative? <laughs> 
like a bread. It's like bread. It's like that pastries. It's in those things. Yeah, it's in those things. So what is it exactly? Gluten is a. Uh, it's like a grain, right? <laughs> I like when he coughed. It's like, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I had some <laughs> in my throat. <laughs> Do you maintain a gluten-free diet? Yeah, I try to, to the best of my ability, yeah. What is gluten? Does she know what gluten is? Oh. oh. <laughs> um, it's the wheat in uh, products such as like bread or pastas, um, rice. Why do you avoid it? It makes you fat. <laughs> I mean, I, like I said, I don't... I'm, I haven't researched it to the fullest. Um, I have a girlfriend from Russia. She actually just got me into it. So she's reading a book about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Russians, Russians know about uh, gluten and Putin. They know about both of them. <laughs> uh, do you maintain a gluten-free diet? I do. I actually uh, don't eat rye wheat, oat, bran, dairy, nuts, or eggs. Wow. What is gluten? Does he know? Does this? Does Jewish John Hamm know <laughs> what gluten kind of is? Uh, it is a part, I believe, of the wheat that uh, I really don't know. It's <laughs> wheat, oh, don't know. So that's what I said. I'm gonna go pick my kids up. Leave me alone. Maybe gluten doesn't exist. Anyway, as you can tell, that's one of my favorite videos. <laughs> Escape, I think. If you hit escape, it will get you out of there. And you, you can get forward to the next slide. Okay, great. I want to do full disclosure who we are. We are funded by wheat commissions primarily. Those are our biggest funders, including the Washington Grains Commission. And also we have some baking companies. And we have the world's largest baking company as one of our members. And we have allied trade companies, you know, people that make baking pans and sell baking pans. So that's who our membership is. And 83% of our income does come from wheat growers. So I just wanted to put that out ahead of time. Um, okay, what is gluten? Well, now you know what gluten is, if you didn't know before, and you probably did. But it is a protein. It's a combination of two proteins, glutenin and gliadin, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But gluten is typically about 80% of the wheat, uh, the protein in the wheat kernel. And uh, it's been about 80%, we'll talk a little bit more of that, for hundreds of years. So it hasn't increased. It's really needed for breads. So if you don't have gluten in there, how many of you are bakers? You know about kneading and developing the gluten, and you need that gluten to hold up a loaf of bread. Now, you don't need it in cookies or a lot of pastries. In fact, it will make pastries and cookies tough, so that's why we use a softer wheat flour for those. So that's basically what it is. And most people don't know that it is a prebiotic for people that have healthy guts. Um, is it, maybe you don't even want to say, but does anybody in here have celiac disease? Okay. So for people that have healthy guts, it's a prebiotic. So it's good for your gut health, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But most people don't know. Now, what is the market? We see these surveys that 30% of Americans are going gluten-free and everybody's going gluten-free. Well, the, the, you get a lot of conflicting information. It depends on who you talk to and what they measure. Some of these companies only measure those products that are made specifically to be gluten-free. Other surveys that you see, they measure all the products that are gluten-free. Well, that includes meats, dairy, uh, vegetables, uh, fruits, all these other foods that are not gluten-free. So it depends on what they measure, whether they're gluten-free. We hear estimates anywhere from $400 million a year to $10 billion. That's a big range. And what we've heard just recently, Arden Mills, who used to be ConAgra and Horizon Milling, uh, they just merged into Arden. They did a study, and they said that in 2012, 
the market was about 831 million. That's a long ways from 10 billion. However, the market really has grown. Um, in 2013, they estimated 1.2 billion, or a 47% increase. Now that's huge. If um, these are gluten-free products that are made specifically to be gluten-free. Um, if our stocks and bonds return 47%, we would be thrown to death. Now, one of the reasons that it's hard to measure is because a lot of people aren't buying gluten-free products because they're gluten-free. They're buying them because they happen to be gluten-free. I mean, popcorn is one of my favorite things in the world. You know, I buy popcorn not because it's gluten-free, but because it's popcorn. Uh, buy rice not because it's gluten-free. So a lot of these in quinoa is gluten-free. That's a really, as you know, that's a really big end product that happens to be gluten-free, but that's not why people are buying quinoa. And then, of course, fruits and vegetables and meats, those are too. And interesting enough, Australia did a similar study in 2011, and they found the same information going on in Australia. And this is a shocker to me. 2.5% of American households buy 70% of the gluten-free products. I mean, that to me, it's not like it's everywhere. It's that people, what they say they're doing and what they're really doing are two different things, and that never surprises us about people, right? <laughs> so it really is a difference, but they do 20, or they do 70% of the sales. And these 2.5% only spend $185 a year on gluten-free products. I mean, that is not huge. Um, I probably do too, but not intentionally. And then an additional 5% are what they call the medium buyers, and they only spend $24 a year in 2012 on gluten-free products. So when you hear that 30% of Americans are trying to go gluten-free, those are just surveys they ask Americans, and what we're finding out is a lot of times women go out for lunch, and they want to impress the other women there that they're up to date on the newest fad, and so they'll order something gluten-free. Or guys go out for a beer and a burger, and they'll order a burger without the bun, but they still have the beer, which makes Mary happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and beer, as you know, is full of gluten. The other thing is, it gives Americans permission to snack. We all like to snack. I love to snack. But most of the launches of new gluten-free products uh, in 2012 and 13, um, they were confectionery. They were snack launches in the gluten-free aisle. 46% of them were. And then in 2013, 50% of the gluten-free products that were introduced were snacks. And there's still a small part of the gluten-free, the whole total gluten-free market, they're only 7%, but they're the newest, biggest introductions. So we're probably going to see more of those. But people think, oh, I could, it's gluten-free, doesn't have calories, it's got to be healthier for me, so I can buy it. Well, we know that's not true. Now, there's some ongoing research that's hopefully going to help celiac disease people. And some of the research is being done at Washington State University. Uh, and they're trying to, they and Tulane, they're trying to reduce the amount of gluten in wheat. Now, people that are celiac, it doesn't matter how much is reduced. If there's any in there of over 20 parts per million, they're going to get sick. But it could help some people that might have some um, tendencies, sensitivities towards gluten. They might be able to eat some of them, but a true celiac would never be able to eat it. But first of all, this is one of the newest things going on in Italy. And they're working on the baking process. They have found a baking process that's very similar to sourdough. And they've introduced some specific bacteria and fungus, which doesn't sound real appealing, but that's what sourdough is, you know. So um, that's really breaking down the gluten. And the gluten's going from like 12,000 parts per million, 10,000 parts per million, down to 12 parts per million. And 12 parts per million is acceptable for people with celiac disease. So there's some real promise in this research that's going on. And something in this field is happening new every week, so I'm always learning. Yes. So does that alter the elasticity then in baking products? If they, they, they say, and I have not seen one of their products, they're doing a presentation at the Whole Grains Council's meeting this November. I'm not going to, but, my, but the vice president, who is also an RD of Wheat Foods Council, is going to. But they say that the structure of the bread is still good. Mm -hmm. it's, 
You know, like some people that have a sensitivity to gluten can eat sourdough bread because it's that long fermentation time and it breaks it down. So we'll see. This is what they say they're doing. We don't know. And is it commercially applicable? We don't know. Then some other really exciting things that are being worked on. One is a vaccine. People that have celiac disease could, or that have the gene, could get a vaccine. I mean, how easy would that be? You know, it'd be like a vaccine against smallpox. Um, they're also targeting zonulin, and zonulin is a new protein that we have just learned about in the last few years that really control our intestine. Uh, as you probably know, our intestine has villi that comes out from it, and they're, they're nice, great shapes, and they, that's what uh, absorbs all the nutrients. Well, if you're celiac, the zonulin causes all those villi to come together, and they're flat, and they just have less surface to absorb nutrients. So people that are really celiac and don't know it and are still eating gluten, they're not absorbing nutrients. And that's why a lot of these people have osteoporosis, they end up with cancer, uh, a lot of them can't conceive. Uh, there's all these other bad things that happen besides them being in pain all the time. And zonulin is what now they know causes this to happen. So there's research going on to prevent zonulin from become, becoming overproduced. It's a protein, and it's being overproduced, and it's causing leaky, what they call leaky gut, which means that the big proteins, like gluten is a big protein, and it's getting um, into the bloodstream and out of the gut without, like it should, without being digested. So they're really working on that. And then there's also an enzyme they're working on that would decompose the gluten um, so it wouldn't affect the body that way. So this is really exciting research that's going on. So there's only three types of people that have to cut out gluten, and that's people that have celiac disease, that's people that have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which I'll talk about in a bit, and then that's people that are allergic to wheat. Uh, they can still eat barley and rye, though, so it's not necessarily the gluten they're allergic to. It's that they're allergic to wheat. Question? Yes, I was curious about the celiac uh, disease. You either have it or you don't? Or are there in-between stages? Yes, and let me get okay. to that. I think that's our next slide. No, it's not, but I will, I will get to that. Um, this new uh, law just went into effect August 1st. If you're going to label something gluten-free, it has to be less than 20 parts per million. Now, the problem with that is that the company doesn't have to test unless FDA comes after them and says, prove that this is 20 parts per million. So there may be some foods that are labeled gluten-free that really aren't, and that's sort of consumer beware. Judy, um, yes. so can somebody with celiacs eat those gluten-free products that are 20 parts per million? Yes, they can have, if it's 20 parts per million, and that's on an average diet. So if it was a gluten-free bread and you had four or five slices a day, you're going to be okay. But if you would eat 20 slices, it would add up so much that you would have problems. But if it's normal, average, they can't, and a lot of research went into what that number should be. So that's for the average, average diet. And that's what 20 parts per million is. It is a crumb, which is why people cannot toast their bread in the same toaster that somebody has celiac disease uses because of that contamination. So, constant gluten-free, uh, in 2008 a study was done in Canada that said it was 242% on average higher than the cost of the, the gluten-containing product it was substituting for, and it has gone down. And you'll see that because there's more of them, there's more competition, it's gone down. It's still 162% higher, but it has gone down a lot. Um, these are the things that you have to avoid, some of the things, and I mean it is endless. You have to read every label, uh, soy sauce, soups, anything canned, condiments, most of them have some sort of a wheat product in them. So it's not an easy diet if you really have celiac disease. It's a pain, you know where it's a pain. Uh, rye and barley, they also contain comparable um, things that come make gluten. Oats, oats are fine if you're sure, 100% sure that there's 
certify gluten-free oats because as you know, on the farm, in the um, trucks, in the harvest equipment, in the elevators they go to, they often come in contact with wheat. So they could have some gluten in them, so you can't do that. But unfortunately, beer, all those kind of things, you have to avoid. Okay, here we go. Let's talk about the celiacs to answer your question, Terry. In the average, it's 1 in 141. A few years ago, we were quoting 101 in 133. And since then, a new study came out in 2012 that says 1 in 141. That's about 0.7 some percent of people. It's a tiny, tiny part of the American public that has celiac disease. But it's also, for those people that have celiac disease, this is a very important you know, problem. Now, when you compare it to other autoimmune disease like autism, right now they're looking at like one in 70, one in 70 having autism. So compared to it, it's minute, but uh, it's still important. And if you're Scandinavian, if you're European descent, you have a better chance. Uh, in the Middle East, there's some people there that aren't of Europe European descent, but they have one in 50 or 60. The Irish have like one in 50 or 60. So if you're Irish descendant, there's a good chance that you might have that gene. First degree relatives, it's one in 22. I actually heard one in 12, but this is the one that's quoted the most. And so I have no symptoms of celiac disease at all, but I'm a member of DIGIT, which is Dietitians in Gluten Intolerance Diseases. It's, Ameri it's part of the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And all my friends in there said, Judy, you gotta get tested because there is such thing as silent celiac. You don't have these outward symptoms. You don't get bloated, you don't get diarrhea. But there is silent celiac and those people end up often with cancer. So I did get tested last year and thank God I have no antibodies. Now, I may have the gene and we'll talk about that, but it hasn't expressed itself. And then if you're a second degree relative, it's one in 139. So if any of you have relatives that do have celiac disease, you might want to get tested cost me $35 for this blood test, it's nothing to get tested and know that you don't have celiac disease in any other time. Okay, oh, it's increasing. We know that it's four times higher than it was 60 years ago. What we don't, that's four times higher than when my brother was diagnosed. What we don't know is why, but we've got a lot of theories that I'll talk to you about. And all autoimmune diseases are increasing. MS is increasing, Di type 1 diabetes is increasing, autism is increasing, lupus is increasing. So all the autoimmune diseases are increasing. It's not just celiac disease, and we have some theories on that too. Question. Uh, you said that when your brother was having his celiac uh -huh. disease, it was still a little bit of a mystery, so yeah. is it possible that some of that could be attributed to just people not knowing that that's what they had, so maybe oh. it's not four times? Well, they, what they did to determine that it was four times they took um, blood tests from recruits for the Korean War, mm -hmm. and they kept these blood samples all these years. And they <coughs> tested those blood samples to nowadays. Mm -hmm. And that's how they determined okay. that it's higher. So you're right. <coughs> this one in 141, they're thinking probably 10% of those don't have a clue that they have celiac disease. It's just not diagnosed. And it used to take 10 to 12 years to get diagnosed. Nowadays, it's really quick. You do a blood test, if that turns out positive, they do uh, a biopsy, intestinal biopsy, which my brother says is horrible. You don't want to do that, but they have to do that to confirm that you do have celiac disease. So is it a, a disease that, I mean, do children, can you recognize it in children right away, or is it something that progressively gets worse as they get older? You know, it, it, it depends. It often comes on in babies, and we'll talk a little bit about the things they're doing to maybe either prolong its onset or that they never have it. Um, but it can get progressively worse as they get older and are induced to more gluten-containing for um, drink. So, yeah, they can do that. First, there's four things you have to have if you're going to get celiac disease. This is what appalled me. I was in D.C. earlier this summer, and I was meeting with one of the Maryland's state baker. I mean, they're the biggest baker company in the state of Maryland. And he admitted to me, I don't know why he did this, it's just crazy. He admitted to me that his wife doesn't eat gluten. 
because she's afraid she's going to catch celiac disease. <gasps> now, he is in the baking industry, and he's that ignorant. He should have been on Jimmy Schimmel. But anyway, <laughs> or she should have been on Jimmy Kimmel. You have to have a gene. And if you don't have that gene, you're never, ever going to get celiac disease. So you can, you could go and have a, you know, a test, because they can do tests nowadays to find out what genes have if you wanted to do it. But a blood test is a lot easier, because then all it shows up is there's anti-gluten, well, anti-gliadin, really, antibodies in your blood. And that's a whole lot easier and cheaper. Yes? Does the uh, NCGS show up in the gluten allergy test? It does not. That's the, one of the big problems. There is no test for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. OK, then you have to be exposed to gluten, of course. If you're never exposed to gluten in your whole life, you're not going to develop celiac disease. But there aren't many countries in the world that never eat something that has gluten in it. So that's one. You must have a leaky gut. And this is something new that we didn't know four years ago. If you don't have that zonulin that's overproducing in there and opening up those areas for your gut, um, you're not going to get celiac disease. And finally, you have to have a trigger. And it can be some sort of a stress. Uh, it can be surgery. It can be pregnancy. It can be an infection. Maybe you come down with some sort of a, a pneumonia or something, virus. Um, you can have a death in the family, a divorce. These things, these stressors, are what brings it on. And for children, or for babies, it's birth, being born. That can be a stress. You know, going through that birth canal is not fun, I understand. I know I did it. <laughs> but, um, so that can be it for babies. But there's all kinds of stressors that can happen. So those are the things you have to have before you get celiac disease. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was curious about the, the not having a leaky gut then could be a silent um, individual. Well, they would still have a leaky gut, but it oh. just when the symptoms are so different. There's there's probably 50 symptoms for celiac disease, and that includes a rash can be some, uh, joint pain can be some. The most common one, and this is the one my brother had, was he was bloated. He I don't know if you've seen those pictures of African yeah, babies yes. that are starving, they're poor, sure, poor babies. That's what he had is this big gut and, and failure to thrive. I mean, I was younger than him, and I used to be able to beat the hell out of him because he was <laughs> such a little, and I didn't know what I was doing, I know, in, my, in my defense. But he just didn't grow. Now, he finally did grow when he got on a gluten-free diet. He finally did grow, and he's probably close to 16 days. But. And, then, and babies uh, vomit rapidly or, or a lot? That's, that's one of the symptoms that can happen, but not necessarily. It's just, and that's why it's so hard to diagnose, because there's all these symptoms and nobody has all of them. But, and some of them, some people don't have any of them. So that's part of the reasons it's taken 10 to 12 years to diagnose it. Um, so oh, sorry, go ahead. The babies who are breastfed, does the gluten, like if the mother eats gluten, does it come through the milk? Is that how they would? That they well, it's it's the introduction it's the introduction of gluten into their food, not through the milk. Okay. But that is, and there there's a lot of research being done on that. And I'll talk a little bit. It's one of these theories of what's causing it with babies. Well, of course, one is increased awareness, better diagnosis. Thank goodness we yes. have that. <clears throat> Two is bacterial overgrowth. We take too many antibiotics. You've heard that. Uh, we take too many antacids, uh, and a lot of this problem is when the mother is pregnant. I've never been pregnant, but I understand there's a lot of heartburn sometimes because <clears throat> of depression and stuff, so women are taking antacids, which, you know, that would only make sense. We don't know that they could be a harm, but we need acid in our gut because acid kills bad bacteria. So when we take antibiotics, it kills all the bacteria, the good ones and the bad ones. When we do antacids, it kills a lot of the good bacteria. So that's not good. And then as we get older, we just have uh, less acid. And so there's bad bacterial overgrowth as we get older. And most of you don't have to worry about that for a while. But it's really important as you get older to know that, that you do need acid in your stomach. High salt intake. This is another. Th now these are theories, okay? Uh, this is another theory that we're eating too much salt, 
and that it is also killing some of the bacteria, you know, good bacteria in our gut. The clean theory, I'm sure you've heard this. When we were kids, we ate mud pies, mm -hmm. we were out in the barn area all the time, I was raised on a ranch, we were always exposed to this kind of stuff. And if something fell on the floor, I mean, I think now they have, what, a five second rule to pick it up. We had an hour rule, but you know, I mean, you know they're just, we just weren't near as clean. Nowadays, if a baby drops one of their pacifiers, oh, they have to sterilize it. No. Wipe it on your yeah. pants and put it back in their mouth. Or maybe don't even wipe it on your pants. But that clean theory is one of the theories. So people don't build up um, any kind of immunity to bacteria. Short fermentation times. Um, my bakers in the industry don't like me to talk about this, but this is one of the big theories, is that when you're making com commercial bread and you're making thousands of loaves of bread every day, that fermentation, the time, you know, you that are bakers, we spend, yeah. you know, probably 35 to 40 minutes for the first rising. Sometimes we do a second rising the same length of time. But in commercial baking, they don't do that. They rush the rising, and the theory is is that they don't have it doesn't have time to break down the gluten mm -hmm. in the rising, like with sourdough. Or if you make that, it's kind of come into vogue. I got the recipe out of the New York Times <clears throat> where you mix up the bread and then it sets overnight. Mm -hmm. That helps too in uh, breaking down the gluten. So um, that's one of the theories. Infant. As you ask, in early feeding practices. Right now, what they're recommending, and this is based on a couple studies in Europe, which I know they're good studies, but when you only have one or two studies that show something, you know, you can't say that this is the answer. But they're finding that if you introduce it between, introduce gluten, like you're feeding them cream of wheat, uh, during four to seven months, while they're still breastfeeding, that is so crucial that they're still breastfeeding because they are getting they're getting antibiotic antibodies from their mother during breastfeeding. So, breastfeeding we've heard forever is really important. Well, for celiac disease, it seems like it's even more important. But they're decent, decreasing the risk for <coughs> celiac disease, wheat allergies, and type one diabetes if they're doing this gradual introduction between four and seven months. So it's sort of like a little window. And some of the research has looked at what happens if you don't introduce it till they're a year old. And that doesn't seem to be helpful. The studies that we have so far don't seem to think that's helpful. It's this little window between four and seven months. But they need to be breastfeeding. Uh, poor diets all, overall. We have crappy diets in the US, excuse me. We have very low fiber diets. About 90% of Americans are getting enough fiber in their diet. Fiber is also prebiotic. It grows good, back, good gut bacteria. Um, grains provide 44% of the fiber in the American diet. So if you go cutting out grains, 72% of grains are wheat, you're cutting out a lot of fiber. You have a question? Yes, I was thinking back to the babies again. And um, I know that uh, blood samples are taken and screened just you know, shortly after birth, mm -hmm. could that be one of the, the screenings that could be done? It could be, and there's a lot of talk about that in the literature that I'm seeing. In fact, I just finished a book by Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's one of the U.S.'s four leading uh, experts on celiac disease out of um, Baltimore. Well, he was out of Baltimore, um, but now he's out of the Boston Children's Hospital. But he... He's saying that's one of the things that he's thinking we ought to maybe start checking for is that gene so you know what to look for and that you can do some other things early on to prevent it. Now, if I have the, if I have the gene, I'm doing something right that I haven't come down with it. Either I have a you know, it hasn't expressed itself. I haven't had enough stress in my life. I think I have, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but some things happen. And that's what I asked Dr. Fasano uh, when I met with him a year and a half ago. I said, why is it that so many women now in their 60s and 70s and 80s are, getting, are coming down with celiac disease? They've had this gene their whole life. Why is it till now it's starting to express itself? 
what are they doing wrong now? And he said, what you need to be asking is what have they been doing right all these years that they didn't come down with it? So that's what they're looking at, is why some people do and other people don't. And I may not have the gene, so anyway. But we do eat, um, we don't get enough vitamins and we eat too many calories. <coughs> so that's, that's one of the, anyway. Increase in cesarean births. When I looked this up, I had no idea that a third of the babies born in this country were born by cesarean. Did you guys know this? Wow. You yeah. knew this. My sisters um, like scheduled their C-sections. Yeah. yeah. Like for when it fit their schedule. Huge. It's it is huge. Yeah. It's, it is huge. It's very bold to schedule your yeah. delivery yeah. instead of having something happen. Yeah. Like just yeah. you know, on a Friday after work. Yeah. Wow. But are they yeah. actually doing <laughs> C-sections or are they just <laughs> inducing labor? C-sections. <laughs> C-sections. Yeah. Well. Talk to anybody you know and do not encourage C-sections. I, I think the trend actually now is reversing. I think, I think yeah. the, the studies have been done enough now and then the new literature that's coming out, because I have seen some recently that say all the benefits to the natural birth versus the C-section. Oh, yeah. So they're starting to try to educate those women about it. Yeah. Those babies aren't going through the birth canal. They're not picking up their mother's antibodies. So it is, and, and a lot of this, of this one third is elective, like you were talking about, it's elective surgery. And so that's one of the things that, that they're looking at real strongly is that that may be why all these kids, now the kids have to have the gene to start with, but uh, if they have the gene and they go through a C-section, they're more likely to come down with uh, an autoimmune disease, not just celiac, but other Increased a weak gluten in the food supply. And here again, a lot of our members aren't, don't like me talking about this, but it's true. And this is one of the unintended consequences of promoting whole grains. For you that are bakers, you know that if you make 100% whole wheat bread, it's going to be heavier and denser. And a lot of kids don't like it. But if you add gluten, which I do when I bake, well, I live at 8,000 feet, so I need gluten anyway. <laughs> but uh, I always add gluten to my whole grain products because it gives it a better texture, a lighter texture. And that's what's happening commercially. They're adding more gluten to whole grain products. And there's more in cosmetics. There's more in all the other food supply. So when you add gluten, you're adding something that's going to give thickness? Is that basically it's what gonna, it's going to It's going to give it that elasticity, okay. and it's going to give it that structure. If it doesn't have that structure to hold air, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be, it's going to fall. And When you say you add gluten to your, I, this sounds like, I'm sure it's a stupid question, but you're baking with whole wheat, uh -huh. and you're right. adding gluten. Right. I How buy gluten. I buy gluten in the grocery store, Bob's Red Mill, yeah. which is right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They have a uh, King <laughs> Arthur. I have a potato, potato cook, so yeah. that's why I have absolutely yeah. yeah. You add it in. Yeah, I put about a tablespoon for one loaf of bread. And now, if you don't live at 8,000 feet, you may not need that much, mm -hmm. but I do for up there to get a decent, decent volume. But so, um, <laughs> if you don't have the gene, if you don't. Um, mm -hmm. Develop all the other triggers that result in celiac. Mm -hmm. Does adding the gluten to the bread, I mean, it doesn't it it cause any harm. It could. We don't have the other. We don't know. It's just if you're just eating, you're just exposed to gluten that much more. Right. That might be because um, you have to be exposed to it. And if you're exposed a lot more, it could be. This is remember. This is a, these are theories. Yes, yeah, but if you don't have the gene, if you don't have the gene, doesn't you matter. Can you can eat all the gluten you want. Yeah. Isn't that true for the non-celiac sensitivity too? Uh, for non-celiac gluten sensitivity, yeah, too much gluten just might makes just their... Just um, might trigger it. Yeah, well, and it makes it so much more, makes the symptoms worse. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But they still may never get celiac disease. Sure. They're two separate things, mm -hmm. and they still may not get celiac disease. But we do know that from 1970-something until now, there's been a three times increase in gluten imports in the U.S. Now, they're not importing them to put them in a storeroom. They're importing them to put, in, put it in food and cosmetics. So we know it's going somewhere uh, in the food supply or cosmetics supply. The number one thing, and this is the one which keeps being pointed to, is changes in our gut microbiome. And I'm sure you've been reading about it. You've seen it. Scientific America's had stories. New York Times has even had stories on gut uh, microbiome. 
There's thousands and thousands and thousands more bacteria in our guts than we have cells, and uh, we're not feeding them properly. And people always talk about, I'm eating to lose weight, or I'm eating to gain muscle, or I'm, nobody ever says, I'm eating to keep my gut bacteria healthy. <laughs> I mean, you know, we don't, but we really do need to. And that's one area that you, you just, I probably once a week see a new study coming out of my gut microbiome. A lot of it's being done on animals right now. I mean, they're cheaper yeah. and they're easier to Yeah, we, we do it to, for animals. We, we do a balanced diet to make sure that their gut is healthy. Good. That's, that's, but that's what the farming industry does. Yeah. Anybody that has cattle, that's what or other animals, that's what you do. You feed partially for gut health. Yeah. That's because right. that's, that's a problem if they're not healthy. Yeah. Well, when I was on the ranch, I hate to tell you how many years ago, uh, we that never occurred to us. I'm sure we did. We fed them, you know, barley and oats and hay and alfalfa. I mean, you know, whatever it was. That's good to know. Yeah, so people need to do that too. The studies going on right now, like I said, are mostly on rats or mice. And they've done studies where they've taken two mice, a fat mice and a skinny mice, and they've taken their fecal content out of them. I hope nobody's just got done eating or you're too crazy. <laughs> they've taken their fecal content and they've switched them. And the fat mouse becomes skinny and the skinny mouse becomes fat. They've done something similar, similar with rats. They've taken an aggressive rat and the nice friendly rat that you always see in the kids' movies, you know, the ratatouille or whatever. And they've taken the fecal content out of those rats and switched them. And the uh, mild and meek, nice rat becomes aggressive and the other one becomes mild and meek. That tells us a lot. And I think that has maybe a lot to do with our obesity problem is that we have bad gut bacteria and we need to you know, work on getting that fixed. And right now, it's a lot of people that have colitis and some of those other, a lot of diarrhea, they're doing fecal transplants. Yeah, yeah I know that. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah. yeah. I'm going to be kind of crude, but when I was telling my husband about it, he said, oh, that gives each shit a whole new word. <laughs> 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 and I said, no, hon, it doesn't come in from that end, it comes in from the other end. But it, yeah. it doesn't necessarily. They're now doing feeding tubes. Oh, down. really? I mean, it's inside the tubes. So right, you're not going to yeah, taste yeah. it. And you're going to be passed out. So right. it's not going to matter. But now they're doing That's tubes crazy. to get that good. Yeah. And they're taking, and this, there's so much we don't know about this. Do you take it from somebody that has similar genes that you do, same age, same whatever? Do you take it from young people that still have good bacteria? Where do you get this? Do, do you have, are we gonna have, you know, we do blood donations? Or are we gonna do fecal <laughs> donations? <laughs> I don't know, but it's fascinating. And this is an area that I think we really need to look at. But when you look at the gut microbiome from the time you're a baby till you're 80 years old, it changes incredibly. Incredible. Well, infants and now are it's changing. sterile, right? I'm they're sorry. They're not track infants. They're completely sterile. Well, when they're first born. No, they no. they have gut bacteria, and you hope it's healthy when they're first born. Okay, that's what I've heard. Is that yeah. there's like nothing in there? Yeah, no. And the mom transfers everything. In fact, um, when they looked at animals, um, they do get um, if you have if you have a sterile uh, rat, for instance, yeah. they have no gut bacteria. They're very susceptible to diseases and they usually don't live. Yeah, right, they die. You need to have gut <coughs> bacteria. So, but, you know, and now they look at like 30 years ago, but gut bacteria people from all those mm -hmm. age ranges, and you can see the difference. But they compared them to now the same ages, and it's totally different bacteria. Well, not totally different, but there's a lot more bad bacteria in our guts than there were 30 years ago. So, but that's exciting, I think. But, yes. Um, the first theory of increased awareness and diagnostics, uh -huh. was that because they're treating people and people are living longer and then they're reproducing? Is that? Oh, well, that's part of it. Well, part of it, yeah, and I really didn't talk about the fact that, like, my brother has two kids, so the likelihood of them having a gene and if they, when they have kids, that kind of thing. So yeah, but that's pretty minor compared to the huge growth. 
But yeah, people just know about celiac disease more now than they used to, and more people are being diagnosed now than they used to. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah before they have too many problems. But those are the 10 theories that are really out there right now, and some of them probably have more promise than others, but we'll see what happens in the future. And, and some of them probably aren't even in my list of 10 that we don't know about yet. Now, questions about non-celiac gluten sensitivity. A lot of people you talk to say, no, I'm, I don't have celiac disease. Of course, I've never been tested. But I do know I'm sensitive to gluten. And I can't eat it, and I feel so much better when I don't have gluten. Because this is what happens to me when I eat gluten. Well, now, I don't have celiac disease, but I've had a, a abdominal pain. I've had rashes. In fact, this is last winter. I had to go get some cream because I couldn't get rid of the rash. Had headaches occasionally. I always have foggy mind. <laughs> Fatigue, <always> diarrhea <laughs> occasionally, depression, numbness in the extremities, that I never have, and joint pains as you get older. So, I mean, these are so broad based that they could be anything. That is it really gluten? Well, um, let's look at the research. The same university <clears throat> in Australia, Monash University, came out in 2011 talking about non cdf gluten sensitivity, that they had done some testing, and they found out that all these people were, were, uh, had sensitivity to gluten. Well, to their benefit, they did another more serious test last summer, came out in August with their research, saying, oops, we were wrong. It's not gluten that's bothering these people. Because they did double-blind studies, the people didn't know what they were getting, the provider that gave them the food, didn't know whether it was gluten or not, and it was really a blinded study. And what they came out with is saying that it's FODMAPs. And FODMAPs, you don't really probably want to know this, but it stands for fermentable oligo dye monosaccharides and polyols. Now, the problem with FODMAPs is that it is huge. Um, it is in fruits, vegetables, grains, um, about the only thing that doesn't have FODMAPs are meat and dairy. It's in everything else. Um, these are just a few. It's in chocolate, for heaven's sakes. So the, these are the oligosaccharides. Now, the one that's in wheat is uh, fructan and inulin. And those are great fibers. <coughs> They're good for most people. They're great that you want to have it. But for people that are sensitive to them, they're not good. Uh, and then the, I'm just going to go down. Pulses and beans have uh, some of the FODMAPs. Polyols is huge. I mean, all these fruits and vegetables that I love, thank goodness, you know, I don't have any sensitivities and stuff. Uh, mono and disaccharides. Oh, they do have some dairy. I said meat and dairy. Dairy is included. It's meat, but it's the only thing. So, Dr. Uh, Stefano Guandolini at uh, Chicago, he is one of those four major researchers in the United States. And he really thinks that there's like 0.5% of Americans that are actually sensitive to gluten. Okay. And when you see the media, you talk to your neighbor, you go out for lunch, I mean, they all are, <laughs> it yeah. seems like. And yet, from the research that he's done, he's saying 0.5%. Now, um, uh, Joe uh, Murray at um, the um, Institute in Rochester, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, I met with him last summer. He thinks it's higher than that. He doesn't. He thinks it's like maybe five percent, but it's not, you know, the huge amount that you would think. But uh, Dr. Gallagher thinks it's less than that. So we don't really have since there's no test for it. And I don't know if you've seen, but in magazines, you can take your blood and you can send it into these companies and they can write back and tell you whether you're sensitive to gluten or not. That's a hoax. Don't spend your money. If your neighbors done it, tell them. That's a hoax. You know, there is no test. Now they're working on it. They're, they're doing some research to try and figure out if there's some biomarker that they find in people that really do have it or something. But as of to date, there is no test for non -CD. Um. I, I've heard that they'll put some children with um, somewhere on the autism spectrum disorder. I'm sorry? Um, some children on the autism spectrum disorder mm -hmm. and other developmental disabilities that they'll put on a free, free lactose free. Yeah, is it 
is it the gluten, or do you, they think it's the all? It could be fine. And the other thing is on that, one of these four big researchers in the U.S. thinks there might be something to this that people, that children with autism are more susceptible to being sensitive to gluten. The other three don't think there's any connection. There's been no research done on large double-blinded studies to show this. Parents often say, oh, they do so much better when they're gluten-free. Yeah. How much of that is psychosomatic? Yeah. How much of that is wishful thinking? What you want. We don't know. And like I said, one out of these four researchers think there is something to it. Uh, the other three don't. But we don't know, because we don't have the research to say one way or another. But it could be FODMAPs instead of gluten. It could be gluten. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, on the last slide, you said pulses and beans. Beans, what are pulses? Pulses are like lentils. Oh, okay. yeah. I should change that. I should leave you out. Pulses and lentils. They're like beans and lentils. I'm sorry, Terry. Uh, legumes. Legumes. Uh, yeah, 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 that would be good. Okay. Are beans for people with like Crohn's disease? They don't know, but they do think um, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, they're thinking that a lot of that may be the FODMAPs. And two, sometimes people that have irritable bowel syndrome, they go gluten-free and they feel a whole lot better. But here again, is it the gluten or is it some of the FODMAPs that are carrying? So we don't know. And it could be Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease is one of the, well, I say it's an autoimmune disease that's increasing because we've always called it an autoimmune disease. I heard a researcher last year at the American Dietetics Association say, that he does not put Crohn's disease in the autoimmune disease category, so I don't know. Weed allergies. Uh, it seems like when I was growing up, half my friends thought they were allergic to wheat. There's a lot of people who think they're allergic to wheat. It is, it is one of the eight big food allergens. And if you have wheat in your food, you have to put it on the label. The federal law is that you have to put it on because it is one. And there's seven different wheat proteins that have been identified as one of these top allergens. It's highest in children, and most of them outgrow it by the time they're teenagers. There's very little in adults. So hopefully, they're, you know, they do outgrow wheat. They usually don't outgrow seafood allergies, which is too bad. How often do those allergies also include not being able to touch the wheat? Yeah. 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 Um, there are some people like they couldn't work in a bakery because it's in the air. They can't work on a farm and harvest because it's around them. So yeah, but that's that's a low percentage. I, I had a, a parent exactly. request that the, the student not had not touch, say, touch yes. the wheat or the soil yeah. that the wheat was grown in. Yeah. Yeah. And wow. or he did anyway, because they had given that to him. <laughs> I didn't see any reaction. It's, it's very so rare that that is a problem, yeah. and it can be for some people. It yeah. can be, that's rare. I um, I did allergy training this summer for a different job, but I asked the lady about wheat particularly. She says it's not a contact allergy, um, and that there should not be a problem with inhaling. Yeah. But of course, if it keeps like that, yeah. I touch it. The parent requests that. Request yeah. 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 I, I did have one teacher get a rash from touching the wheat, but she thinks that because she's allergic to grass, would that be the same thing? No. So they're not going to go into anaphylactic shock. You know, right. she's going to have a rash. Uh, and she thought she's allergic to grass, so she thought it was the same thing. Ooh. Yesterday, it is part of the grass family. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So then we so later figured think? this out like two months later. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is, when we were harvesting yesterday, Maria, who was here last year, she would break out in these red bumps when she touched Eyes. the wheat, but she eats wheat. And I'm, I have a, I mean, I don't know, but it's so prickly, it just right. kind of pokes at yeah. your skin and it kind of yeah. stays there until you wash it all off. Mm -hmm. I mean, so but yeah, if it's in the grass, maybe that's what I it is. I guess I get confused when kids say they're allergic to wheat. Yeah. Uh -huh. and what does that mean? Because we give them a stock of it uh -huh. to stretch uh -huh. and they okay. touch it, but not just, not ingest it, uh -huh. or <clears throat> it would be rare. <laughs> That would be very, very rare. Okay. Yeah, 35% of adults say that they have a food allergy, 35%. When they actually test them, it's exactly, it's 3.5%. <laughs> it's all 10 wow. times less. Yeah. Huh. But anyway. So let's look. Now, how much time? Am I taking you're too good. much time? Oh, yeah. Lunch okay. is at noon, so you're, you're oh, good. Okay. Rumors about wheat. This is some of the things that you're going to hear, or you probably have already heard, and I'm hoping to answer them. That wheat's higher in gluten than it was 
in the early 1900s that it's addictive, <laughs> that it's genetically <laughs> modified, that's the problem. Uh, Gluten-free foods are healthier. We consume more wheat than we have before, so that's a problem. Wheat and gluten make us fat, like the gal on Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, eating so much wheat is what's causing this increase. This is sort of a new one that oh gluten is about your bones. Um, and that gluten is a structure similar to a fungus, candida, and it can cause infections. And it destroys the keratin, collagen, and can cause hair loss and nails. So these are some of the ones I'm going to address. All right, the first one. This is an easy one because we have research that backs it. Um, in the U.S., Dr. Don Casarga at USDA, did a, he went back, you know how we have seed banks, and he went back and looked at gluten content from 1924 until now. And there's no appreciable difference in the gluten content in wheat. The only time there's a difference is if there's a difference in protein. And for you that are farmers, you know that if you have a dry summer, you're going to have increased protein. You have a wet summer, you have less protein. That's the only differences that he found. Uh, Dr. Ravi Shabar in Canada, he did a similar study, only he went clear back to 1860, um, where the red, red fife wheat was brought in to Canada and there's been no change in there. The only change is, as I mentioned earlier, gluten addition to the actual foods, not but not in wheat. Now, Dr. Chabar is doing a study right now looking at the gluten content. And I'm keeping, I'm holding my breath, keeping my fingers crossed, that he's not going to find a difference in the gliadin and the glutenin. Those are the two proteins that make up gluten. If, they're, if they have changed something, then there could be a problem. And we should find that out as well. So, you know, that, that may be one of the things that changes. We're hoping not, but I'm glad he's doing the research, so we'll know. Um, Would those results be posted on your website or not? Oh, probably. Probably. <laughs> probably not. Huh? I mean, you can't ignore the research that you don't like yeah. and just talk about the good stuff. Because if that is a problem, then what we need to do is have wheat breeders go back mm -hmm. and read and look at the varieties that don't have the increase by or the different changes in why I the lieutenant and breed more of that wheat. We've got to, if that is the problem, mm -hmm. we've got to correct it. But I'm I'm just hoping that's not the problem. Would you think, though, that if that was true, that that would be more in the hard reds than it would be in the soft way? Because, I mean, gluten Just because there's less to start with. Right. Start with. And yeah. because they're trying to increase the gluten. Well, actually, that isn't true. In some cases, yeah. they were saying the gluten was too strong. Right. And they reduced the gluten yeah. in some of the hard reds. Yeah. But because we predominantly produce soft white, mm -hmm. and it's a low gluten, I mean, I, and that, that kind of gets a little too complicated for the level that you guys are even trying to talk at. But yeah. I guess I wouldn't necessarily say it would be true with all classes. Well, and that's what he's going to find out, because he's looking at all classes of wheat in Canada. And the classes of wheat in Canada aren't that much different than the classes of wheat in the U.S. I mean, there are differences, but... Ours are better. <laughs> oh, I forgot that. <laughs> Okay, today's wheat is different. That's one of the ones. Uh, you, if it, have any of you read or heard about, you've all heard about the Wheat Belly Book? Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that Davis says. And he can write this book with absolutely no scientific info, you know, background to support it and get it out in the bestseller list and make money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so sad. But anyway, he's saying that the 18-inch wheat that we have today is due to genetic modification, and uh, it's higher, in, the gluten content is higher than it was 50 years ago. Well, we know it's not higher in gluten. Like I said, we don't want the composite. But we have, well, I'll go on and tell you what's really true. We have wheat now being grown around the world that's anywhere from 12 inches to 60 inches. Most of the wheat is shorter in stocks because of lodging, because of harvesting. You know, the tall ones fell over. And why put all the nutrients into a stock when the heads are really where you want the nutrients to go and... Did you have a question? No, okay. Um, so yeah, there is a shorter wheat because thank goodness to Dr. Borlaug who saved 
a lot of people from starving to death. Um, and hide genes, hide of the wheat, don't code for protein or gluten. And as one of our advisory board members, I love to quote her, she says, if you're be breeding a baby for blue eyes, it doesn't affect the length of their toes. <laughs> I mean, there's no connection between, you know, those kind of things. So, anyway. Um, and there is no GMO wheat in the entire world, as I'm sure most of you know. There's research being done all over the world, and Mary, correct me on this, but I have heard that Australia is probably going to be the first one that commercializes GMO, and then us and maybe Canada about the same time, have you heard? That's what is rumored to happen, but I guess it's all speculation, mm -hmm. and I know that there's been a, there was an agreement signed that they would all do it and by Together to do it together, but um, the, interestingly enough, most of the companies that are involved in genetically modified wheat here in the United States also have Australia and you, a lot of European ties and Canada. Good point. So it's it, you know, and to think that they're not working.